All right, we are recording. Just one second. I'm just gonna grab... Sorry, I'm late. I just ran here from the park. It's a, <laughs> it's a very stoner thing to do to be playing piano in the park <laughs> with people and then realize that you're late for 420 and have to run off suddenly. <laughs> like, what? It's 410. That means I'm late. I felt like the rabbit in Alice in Wonderland or something like that. So in Kensington? Yeah, there's an outdoor piano there. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, um, my drummer and I were doing shows there in the summer, um, just something to do during COVID. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So what's up, man? I haven't, it's been a few years since we've spoken that not via text, basically. Yeah, it's been well, at least four, right? Uh, I've been in Pakistan for the past four years. And so far, so good. Yeah, it's going well. Yeah, going well. Got married, have two kids. Wow. Uh, yeah, have an interesting job finally. So, oh, really? so yeah, life is quite different. So um, have you learned a lot from having kids? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, in that case, you should be telling me what you've discovered. <clears throat> well, uh, got empirical data it, right in your hands right there. Oh, sure. Yeah, well, it definitely changes your perspective on, on what's important, right? It does place a lot of constraints on, you know, what you can do. Uh, also, you think twice about what you can say and so on. Uh, though it isn't as challenging as some people make it out to be. Sure, there are logistical challenges and, uh, you, you know, you have to uh, do more than just make in, ends meet for yourself. Uh, but the actual, like, uh, sort of training little people to be big people is uh, it's not just about height. <laughs> yeah it's not just about height. uh it, it's it's not uh, something that you require you know uh, a degree in education for or anything like that right if you have uh the, the sort of basic kind of sense of well you know these are the things that that you would want uh yourself to be at that age right then you you just sort of try to break it down in a language or actions or behavior that, that someone that age can understand, right? And it doesn't matter whether they're, you know, six months old or whether they're two years old, uh, there sure. is a certain, a certain level. Mm -hmm. So where do you find the biggest early discrepancy between who, what did you say, who you would want to be at that age and who they are and who you were and who the people you knew at that age were at that age? And also mm -hmm. the people who you knew, knew that weren't that age were back when they were that age. You know what I mean? Like there's so many right. different samples of people at that age. There's like, you know, your mother mm -hmm. at that age, you're that age, your friends at that age, your, the ideal you had at that age, that age, the deal you have now of that age, mm -hmm. that age you know? So anyway, there's a million ways to look at it, but, but so that's why I would say, where do you find a discrepancy? Because maybe, maybe they most mostly line up. Well, sometimes it does throw you for a loop when you expect uh, it, the child to be just a little you and you realize, oh no, wait, there's more, more going on here. Uh, yeah. I can't just sort of apply that that you know heuristic of if I re rewound myself and, and found myself at that age, what would I tell that person as opposed to this sort of you know uh, composite of you and this other person, right? Uh, that's a completely different question that, that you wind up asking yourself all of a sudden, and. Yeah, you, you notice, like I noticed with my son, who's uh, almost three now, uh, that he is more prone to anger than than I think I was at that age. Uh. So you know, hard to tell. Uh, so uh, I, I have to adjust things like that. But on the other hand, like there there are like clear commonalities between you know what I remember myself to be, if not at two, at four, where he's inquisitive. He asks a lot of questions. Uh, he does uh, lose patience when it comes to things that are, you know, above his challenge level, right? That's something that was very common with me. So it, it's very interesting to contrast, you know, uh, past me to this, uh, you know, tiny person or, or proto person, uh, depending on what, what your take on that is. Well, if I might interject, I think the, the right, response to losing patience at things above your ability level is to subdivide the problem 
Yep, absolutely. And, and that, that's something that, that you have to teach work the kid. And the other part, you may, maybe someone else is going to solve the rest of it. Uh, I mean, it depends if it's like a, a you problem completely, like you have to solve your life or something. But like some problems are not just you. Like a lot of the things that actually stress people out are like societal problems, you know, like climate mm -hmm, change. Mm -hmm. you know, the person, no, there is no personal solution to climate change, right? It's, it's Although there is a personal problem. solution to figuring out how to blow up a balloon, right? Well, there's a personal solution to freaking out too much about climate change. True. Like, like, like there personally is freaking out too much, like, like, like in a way that's not like where it just creates stress and then mm -hmm. um, not progress. Mm -hmm. But yep. I don't know if you're ext Extinction Rebellion in Toronto, the Toronto chapter shut down amid allegations of abuse of I, basically of, um, I believe, activists by organizers or maybe it was organizers by other organizers, something like that. Um, and they just like sort of diverted all their funds to other causes. And I think they said like, oh, Toronto might open another chapter, but so, so much for, mm -hmm. I, as far as I know, I don't know what, um, they, they were the most visible um, climate group in Toronto at the, at the time. Extinction of the, the Rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, they were very effective, arguably in London, where in London, England, where they first got started and some like high profile people were getting arrested as a form of climate activism and so on. But, you know, mm -hmm. I went to one of their meetings here and, and just like followed up on email a little bit um once and the very first thing they did to new uh recruits i guess at the meeting is they handed you a questionnaire where you told them how willing you were to get arrested what yeah they asked okay. you like it was like a likert scale like like basically how devoted are you like basically how much can we exploit you um in my interpretation <laughs> of it at this point because like i don't know how strategic any of it was um especially because I, you can see on the face of it that it's exploitative because they didn't ask like how much learning how much time do you have to spend mm -hmm. on learning you know or like right you know like like what do you think is it i don't know they're were, they were just sort of like um a bit like well this is the end of the world therefore we need people who are totally committed and like okay well, well the, that, might not that does make sense, do sense to, to, to some degree but if all they're trying to do is push people to perform more and more outrageous stunts in the name of anyway, climate change I, I don't i don't know any of the story behind why they shut mm -hmm. down so I won't, I won't speculate it would be very interesting if anybody could um provide more information about that you know it's um mm -hmm. it's like there, there must be there must be a lot of lessons that people could learn who had nothing to do with the group of like why did an activist organization end up that way um mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. presumably that's bad so uh, how do you avoid it um i don't know if those stories will come out or not but um mm -hmm. that's fair yeah i did see uh your recent post on, on uh Rochdale. oh yeah, yeah yeah in fact i just mm -hmm. met somebody in the park who had, uh, they were talking about Rochdale back in the day and how cheap and good the acid was and stuff. Uh, this guy <laughs> in the park where the piano was. Um, yeah. He was My high school computer science houses. teacher actually uh, lives in those apartments, or I don't know, used to live in those apartments, right. which I found kind of funny. Because now it's, it's, they're, they're just regular apartments, right? Yeah, I think they're government uh, subsidized housing. Did right. they change the sort of internal structure of uh, the floors that were sort of more communal or are they set up the same way? And I think uh, they're spo supposed to be yeah, similar to I the way Tartu is, tour. right? I actually went on a tour of the building at a Rochdale event, but they, I don't, they didn't really go into the residences, so we didn't really see um, mm -hmm. they change that. Um, I'd but, imagine the Tartu, Tartu would be similar, right? Yeah, Tartu is still set up the way Rochdale was architecturally, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's... Because in the in the videos, if you watch Green Tower or whatever, the desks and everything all look the same. Like I was there when they finally renovated some of that stuff and they moved people around. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was um, it was it was it was a it's a little funny to to see this documentary the Rochdale where my mother did live and then be like, oh, those are the same desks as where I lived in Toronto, like across the mm -hmm. street. Right. Yeah, and same was desk that a that sort of deciding factor in in depicting that residence? Well, actually, no. All I did was look for a residence where I could have my own room because that's how I grew up with my own space. So weird. Um, and, and there weren't many of them. And also, sorry, because I was also a music student at the time. In first year, I was strictly enrolling in music before I got into everything else in my third year of uh, post-secondary. Um, so there were only so many residences that were both available to students outside of the arts and science faculty, such as the music faculty and like engineering, et cetera, uh, that also had individual rooms. So you weren't exactly. aware of the similarities between uh, Tartu and Rochdale at the time? No, my mother pointed out when she came to visit me, she was like, oh, fuck, this looks exactly like Rochdale. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, well, Whoa. that's weird. Oh, yeah, it's right there out your window. I'm like, oh, that's where it was. Because she told me stories about it. I didn't really actually understand that it was that building at the time. I was like, oh, 
that's the place. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, yeah. Yeah, I haven't actually watched all the stuff that I, f- I found on YouTube. I before I just watched the Dream Tower as far as like media that's out there. But... Mm-hmm. Neat. Reg Hart says his book is enough and he he doesn't, because I, I told him a couple of times, um, make more YouTube content about Rochdale. But he was saying, well, the point, he said, it's, he actually said, me, me an he said, it's kind of a distraction that the point is encouraging people to be their own teacher. That is the point. Is that the guy with the weird videos? Uh, yeah. yeah, he used to he used to be the film department at Rochdale, more or less. I mean, they didn't have teachers at Rochdale. Everybody was their mm-hmm. own teacher on that model, but they were um, quote unquote resource people who would like suggest maybe a reading list to you or like watch these films as part of your study of film or these books about it or whatever it might be. So there were there were resource people, um, but there were no teachers other than the teacher that you were to yourself. Nobody was anyone else's teacher on that model. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I know that name from you know like print out posters on, on lampposts and stuff, right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's the part of the Rochdale diaspora, I suppose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wonder how like widespread that is and, and uh, you know, where those people are now concentrated, if at all. Well, I just met somebody in the park. I don't know, I guess they're in the park over there. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> well, the, you know. I wouldn't say that that's very widespread. It's like not even a kilometer away, right? Yeah, well, some people, maybe, some people came out to the event um, that where I got the tour of the building, they were giving stories when they were in Rochdale. So they do occasionally have a, like a retrospective events and, and talk about it. But they're, um, as far as I could tell, nobody there was involved in a similar education project today. It, it seemed all very retrospective and like discussing what happened and like, okay, the lessons to be learned from it and so on. But um, I, there was no like, oh, and this is what we're trying now. I, I didn't, I didn't mm-hmm. uh, hear that in any anything that I, I found really. Um, I've heard that a little bit um, in terms of, uh, I, I know a guy who wants to start a Sudbury school, which I understand used to exist in Toronto. That's applying democracy to uh, K-12 levels. So Rochdale mm-hmm. is both secondary. Maybe that's inherently more fraught with peril. I mean, like, geez, like people's parents aren't even in their lives at that point. What are they going to do with freedom? Yeah. Because like, they didn't have it up until then. So maybe you actually need to do mm-hmm. this earlier first in the first place to avoid the chaos of Rochdale. Maybe. I mean, you can decentralize schooling online with all of the, you know, um, problems of the physical locality at the moment, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but online education is to go over kids. At any rate, the Sudbury model is basically just to have direct democracy in schools, analogously right. to how worker co-ops are having direct democracy in the workplace. And you could have direct democracy in your actual democracy. Mm-hmm. I think I remember it was Jacqueline that was doing a paper on that, Jacqueline K. Oh, uh, about- uh, it was about Sudbury schools and about you know the, the effectiveness of allowing students to sort of direct their own curriculum, that sort of thing. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that, that that sounds like Sudbury School. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure um, mm-hmm. how much overlap, uh, but yeah, it sounds like quite a bit. Yeah, the- um, Speaking of the, the sort of new necessity for e-learning, I was just thinking how interesting it is that, you know, this conversation that we're having is probably no different from a conversation that you would have with someone in the city that you're in, or me having a conversation with, with someone in the, in the city that I'm in right now, just because, you know, the, this is the way we do work these days, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm. I mean, I, cause I'm actually thinking in terms of like, cause my, my hope is that we can get the ball rolling on some kind of decentralized podcast where it's not like mm-hmm. you or me or Aaron or anybody in particular starting their podcast. And it's not even uh-huh. a small team of people who are the podcasters and other people are guests. It's just that, you know, mm-hmm. people are talking to each other. Yeah. Just could convert some of those conversations to be public facing. Mm-hmm. And then to make sure that it's not a centralized podcast, um, don't repeat too much. So like, sure. af- after this conversation, you and I are going to have other conversations, maybe public facing or not, but like mm-hmm. the, the, the degree to which people, um, um, swap who's in charge is the degree to which you can avoid this kind of ossification of power. power. Mm -hmm. Right. What's interesting is that I I was considering doing something not not exactly like this, but similar to this. And uh, I, you know, did a trial run by sending a sort of YouTube message to Rob McKenzie and just, you know, asking him how he was and stuff like that. And I, I was debating between, you know, the most efficient or the most valuable format for something like this. And a few ideas that I had were to, of course, have uh, a live stream like having right now. But on the other hand, I thought that it may be valuable to have sort of uh, a larger 
time quantum of, of conversation flowing one way and then another way. So uh, that, that's that's why I went with you know just having a recorded message and sending it off, uh, but having it public. Uh, and and then you know I left it on the recipient to decide whether or not they're going to reciprocate or not. That was just completely optional for them. Uh, you know, if if they wanted to, they could just send a reply back privately or whatever the case may be. And what's like interesting is that mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, I just going to say I feel like the real time addresses some of the issues that we currently have with the internet of like how much of a dumpster fire Twitter is and so on. It's like people aren't really communicating. They're like they barely read what you write if you write a lot, and if you don't write a lot, they they guess that you're an asshole or you know they fill in, people will fill in the gaps uncharitably if they're trying to win rather than trying right. to understand. Is what I'm saying. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. Uh, and then what's interesting is that recently Rob McKenzie that, actually did, did something else that wasn't exactly the same, but uh, still very interesting where he started a newsletter just, you know, for friends, asked whoever to sign up. And it was mostly just, you know, personal stuff, stuff that he'd found on the internet that was interesting, things happening in his life and so on. And although I didn't follow up on the follow through on this, I, I was in sort of uh, I felt the urge to uh, reply with another newsletter uh, to him and to other people uh, around around me in my circle, and so that would be sort of a similar decentralized uh, pattern, like like you're talking about, except that it was in uh, in email form instead. So that would have been interesting. Yeah. Because you know, it's it's funny. I think I think there, a couple of years ago was the was the year of jokes of how well eventually everybody will have their own podcast. But then it's kind of like, well, it's twenty twenty, and we don't all have our own podcast yet, mm -hmm. right? And like, wouldn't we be communicating better if we all did? Uh, I think like, it, it wouldn't democracy be a lot healthier if everyone had their own podcast? I mean, compared to everyone having their own Twitter feed, for instance. I mean, um, I don't know if people are just camera shy. Um, well, camera shy is is part of it. Then. Uh, as you mentioned, like if you're comparing it to Twitter, and we already have uh, the serious problem of uh, backlash because of you know just offhand comments that someone may have had. They don't have to necessarily be sexist or racist or anything like that. Just something that someone accidentally sent coming back to you know really bite them in the ass. Uh, there is that potential, right? If you have something on record as opposed to just something that, that you said over the phone and it's gone, even though we know that it's not really, really gone. Uh, but it, it sort of amplifies okay, that well risk. Then, well, then so then take both of those facts together. And that means that that fear is, in fact, preventing the greater empathy that we would have if people were video chatting in real time, um, yep. as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's, yep. that's a mechanism of polarization. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that that, that isn't something that necessarily will be resolved by like have, having conversations more uh, out in the open uh, in, in the short term, but well, perhaps think, in the long term, right? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, mean, I guess I'm saying that um, maybe, there, maybe there's a merit to um, just sort of biting the bullet and be like, yeah, well, you know, I'm just gonna start, because basically, I, you know, like five, five years ago is when I first posted that thing that you had commented on before of, of the idea of maybe doing an unstructured thing. And at that point, I wasn't really thinking of doing it live, but that was five years ago. It wasn't even like a common thing then. I mean, hey, the internet was slower. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know, not that much slower, but um, at that time I was just beginning performing. And it's, uh, I think it was just after that that I met Rosie, of course, and we've been doing a lot of performing. And um, mm -hmm. Of course, when I first started then, although I've been doing composition stuff over there, I still had stage fright because I wasn't like a um, experienced performer. And what I found there is I just had to exhaust myself. I just did it so much that it became tiring rather than frightening. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I figure, um, well, if I'm going to live stream conversations, I'll just like, like literally produce as much content as possible. And then I'll be tired rather than afraid, you know, um, you know. <laughs> so the, Z the Zappa option. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly mm -hmm. the Zappa option. Yeah, you know, I just, I have to, that reminds me, I have to watch the new Zappa documentary. <laughs> some stuff. About I, I just it. saw that a couple of days ago. Yeah, I, I, I mean, like I saw a trailer for it or something. Yeah, that'll be, I, I will enjoy that. <laughs> I feel like that will be yeah. good is like maybe too objective sounding for some someone as like eccentric as Zappa, but certainly I will enjoy it. <laughs> nice. So what else is new? What else, what's on your mind? There's, all, I'm sure a million topics we could uh, explore here. Oh yeah, exactly. I really do have to have to mention that I, I am enjoying the sort of 
efficiency of conversation because you know we know each other and there isn't this need for this huge preamble right mm -hmm. imagine if instead you were like interviewing someone that you didn't know right you'd have to sort of tune yourself to what the other person knew and didn't know right you'd have to or you, size or them up more general things yeah that's true but that that isn't as interesting right open them up, someone up personally like like that that's sometimes expecting too much maybe Oh, sure. You don't want to, you know, pry or anything like that, but you, you do have to get a sense of, you know, what the other person can easily, you know, digest and then, well, you know, <laughs> reply yeah. intelligently to. Well, yeah, I guess. Well, there, there are, there are, like, if you watch videos of like computer science or math talks and colloquia online, they're now going way more online. You'll get people mm -hmm. who, who they do, they do have a conversation. They don't know each other at all at the beginning. And they still don't don't at the end because they weren't talking exactly to they were talking about the work and they were um but they were matched for ability level because of the nature of the event okay so mm -hmm. um they didn't have to they didn't even even have to get to know that part they would just kind of like present their material and then someone would ask like on point questions and then they would answer and they they wouldn't have to know anyone's backstory or you know like i guess that really wasn't the objective for something like that right yeah exactly so i mean but you might say, like, if everyone's supposed to talk to each other for the sake of politics, well, what's the role of mathematics in politics? Because, like, Abraham Lincoln carried around a copy of Euclid's Elements everywhere he went. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, so I, I, so I think in political discourse, sometimes that impersonal mode is, like, because those people are just going to, because you could just walk up to a stranger and start, start talking to them about COVID statistics, right? You could be like, did you sure. know this is, this is a mm -hmm. fact? And they could be like, I disagree. I cite the following theorem. I mean, I mean, unfortunately... <laughs> It turns out we need that kind of education. Uh, it's not just a specialist thing where you can have some people do that boring stuff and no one else has to worry about it. Because, like, I mean, how how can you know? Um, actually, I made this argument to Karen Ow the other day um, in, in mm -hmm. a thread. I was saying uh, that basically, you know, we have to be able to have a public conversation about COVID. COVID, for example, that's an easy example. There's many other examples, of course. And to have that conversation, you have to understand statistics. And to really have the conversation the way we're not on autopilot, you have to understand the foundations of statistics, which is something that I need to learn more about too. Um, and um, those foundations are uh, in philosophy and analytic philosophy. Like you tend to reduce, mm -hmm. um, like there are axioms of probability that like that's an easy easy it, that's a pretty good starting point as far as making sense of statistics and what people are talking about is like working mm -hmm. from the axioms of well to understand those axioms that's formal logic is going to help you understand that and it's like well guess what there's a connection between formal logic and coronavirus and like you know that's where um yeah. this is in the context of me saying that like it's good for um feminism to be aligned with analytic feminism and um okay there's this question of like well okay is it classes to expect people to have mathematical ability or something like that to participate in discourse it's like well in the, some cases like in the case of coronavirus it's like it's true there's many questions that don't require that kind of careful analysis and we shouldn't sh we, we, we shouldn't set an arbitrary barrier to entry like oh you have to be able to understand mm -hmm. xyz to come to this but sometimes it is the subject matter right you know um because, sure you know, and i think covid is a really clear example of that because there's so many so much statistics involved you know well, the ability to, uh, uh, you know, disseminate information that we have now sort of it, it doesn't eliminate, but lowers the barrier of entry, doesn't it, right? You, you could just say, well, go well, off and, read, and read this like five minute primer on, on such and such topic and, and come back and you'll understand this a lot better. Well, there's a trade off. There's um, the distra distraction of social media raises the barrier to entry for everything, though, because like if people are addicted to the instant gratification of Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, it's. Um, I mean, I really found like, you know, hands up. I I've had all sorts of different kinds of social media addictions, and you know, mm -hmm. um, when in terms of Facebook, um, I found watching more YouTube was a great way to be less addicted to Facebook. <laughs> and, it, and it's because well, the, of the, that's the methadone solution right yeah something like that it, it, it's <laughs> it's well except um well yeah because it's less addictive but also it's higher information bandwidth so it's okay. it's, it's, it's the meta meta methadone solution because you are, <laughs> what you're feeding yourself isn't just another drug it's the very information you would need to be making free choices mm -hmm. okay that's fair because there's this that much more information in like 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 if you've never heard someone from the other side speak at length say like in u.s polarized politics and you've never just listened to somebody from the south talk about their views for an hour mm -hmm. then 
you know, no wonder you don't understand them or, and like that the, this discourse is polarized and it's filtered, if it's, especially if it's all filtered through the sound bites or like Twitter uh, brief you know, bits of text, like on Twitter right. and that kind of thing, you know. And the information bubbles that people live in these days. Yeah, uh, yeah it does not surprise me at all that, that they're being fed an alternative reality to what we are. Yeah, and we know what, what Aaron was saying in the footage that we lost um, yesterday was um, how he was um, talking with a, a friend of his, and I've heard this in many quarters, just lamenting the lack of left content on YouTube and especially um, in Canada. Um, so like Christ. Do you think that's nothing, true? Well, well, what's okay? What what is your favorite leftist Canadian on YouTube? Ooh. I don't know if I have a favorite Rick, leftist Canadian. Rick, Rick, <laughs> I don't even know how he votes. I'm not sure he'd tell us. Mm -hmm. It'd be bad for his That's brand. Fair. He wants he wants everyone to laugh. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And maybe I mean, I I I watch very little. Someone's probably if, if literally anybody sees this and knows anything about Rick Mercer, they probably know something that I don't because I haven't seen uh, much Rick Mercer. But the impression I get from the comedy is that it's not very biting. And that it, it's not really um well it's also not um youtube focused like this is also in the, in the space because look there are people who just watch youtube and what politics yep. and there's a lot of them and what politics do they get it skews right for sure um it skews i mean okay. it skews right and it skews male youtube um mm -hmm. which which is part of what happened i mean it's not to say that peterson isn't a somewhat conservative guy but um his viewers being male and uh, and right is partly due to YouTube because you know his his students were a completely different demographic at U of T. Mm -hmm. Yep. The whole Peterson thing was interesting to follow from afar. Did you ever take his classes? Uh, I took personality. Oh yeah. And how I was took, that? Yeah. 2.30. Uh, I think I attended about half the lectures if that but uh, you know it was what it was. It, it was yeah the, the parts that were, you know, more focused on, you know, the big five scale and stuff like that w made sense. But then there were maybe tangential or, or illustrative parts that may be too focused on, on some aspects of personality. Uh, just, you know, like Oedipal complexes was, was a big thing, right? Uh, they, they showed uh, influence. He, he, yeah. the Robert Crumb documentary. I remember that. I still haven't watched that. I've been watching. I've watched um, Robert Crumb's work, but not the mm -hmm. uh, documentary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, there's that. And what I find interesting is that uh, after it, it was after uh, that uh, whole controversy and uh, Peterson being in the limelight that. Uh, more people sort of began to increase their presence on YouTube and elsewhere. And I'm thinking, of course, of John Berbeke, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, hardly, uh, you, you, you can't say that it is anywhere near as controversial. And I, I'd say much more grounded in, in, in reality, but uh, it is interesting that uh, the, the me medium of video, uh, sort of has become more favored uh, since then uh, for you know academics that would probably uh, not go that route for whatever reason previously. Yep. Yeah, yeah and that, that's a positive effect. Making YouTube more academic can only mm -hmm. uh, enable people. Right. On, on like a, in a like tie that raises all boats kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fair. Have you uh, a selectively enabling of their least favorite fans of Peterson? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, hey, I've got lots of disagreements with him, and um, his 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 entry technique left about as much to be desired as as Donald Trump's uh, did with uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, his birtherism. But you know, um, well, anyway, more to the point, Peterson is back producing content again now, so there's any all the more need for more content on the left. Um, on, right on YouTube in, in video format because one of the things at the time is like people in academia were kind of confused why Peterson was so popular because they would compare him to like all of their other professors and be like well I don't know why aren't these other professors saying it's like well they didn't record their lectures for years and they didn't you know they didn't just make it they didn't make a business out of it um, so it's volume it's being an early adopter I mean that's that was Peterson's own analysis okay. in, in one video that he had, he has to acknowledge that he's not as like special as he might want to think but he's an early adopter of a, of a radical mm -hmm. technology 
Well, at, at least he's somewhat self-aware, right? Uh, yeah, he got. Yeah, he, that was a little later after the. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he didn't say that immediately on day one. Of course, he didn't really know what was happening. Sure. On day one, so. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, there there are like a few redeeming uh, aspects of what he says and does, uh, but th th there's a lot that that uh, that is to question or that should be questioned for sure. Mm. Well, uh, as the anarchist principle uh, goes, you know everything should be questioned, right? <laughs> yeah, including power hierarchies and why they're good and you know. Mm -hmm. Which which one you should care about, or if any, and of the established yep. ones, and yeah, you know, it's um, well, you know, he he said in a in a panel discussion at the end of the Mind Matters on Power. I don't think this is recorded anywhere, um, certainly not publicly available. He said that he has a horror of collective action. Um, because in his mind, because this is the same context where Dan Dolderman is like promoting collective action, how to get better at collective action, how to do more of it. And Peterson said he has a horror of it. So keep that in mind that as a as this influential he's an influential person influencing many 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 people, and he has a horror mm -hmm. of collective action. When in fact he could be, I mean, I mean this I mean this is reassuring to some people that who might think that the kind of collective action that Peterson would want would be bad. Um, maybe it would be, and maybe that's why Peterson has a horror of it. Um, well, I, I think it, the, part of the danger is to sloganize something like that, right? That you're not the one deciding what it is if it's truly collective action. So, like, why be so mm -hmm. afraid of it? Um, right. Perhaps the sort of image that, that that brings to mind is one of, you know, a lynch mob or something like that, where you yeah, have. I guess so. Uh, a, it is true. Right? It is a form of collective action and the tyranny of the majority in democracy that is a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I tend to think we should be trying more democracy, not less in most cases. Like, I mean, or maybe that's just sure. a different axis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the other sort of uh, interesting thing to have witnessed from afar in Canada was uh, the failure of Trudeau to follow through with his promise of proportionate representation. Yeah. Everybody was like, let's do it. Oh, I knew there was a reason. Didn't do it. I, that was one of them. That was I was like, yeah, as as if as if you were going to change that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think this is why I think the pirate party has their um, has the the cart ahead of the horse. Um, well, basically, the, the the short route, the end run, is software development of things that are more democratic than what we have. I mean, in Taiwan, the government commissioned software to make things more democratic. But okay. it, it might require uh, things outside of government funding in in the West for it, for it to happen, because um, you know you can adopt software, but you have to have the culture of, of using it as well, and all this kind of thing. And um, mm -hmm. like for instance, um, you know people could uh, develop an app to let people vote on what their representatives voted on, and be like, whether okay. they agree or not, like. You know, just do you agree? And, mm -hmm. then, and then just collect stats on that. And then you'd know who the least representative representative is and the media could have a field day shaming them for being this person who votes completely differently from their constituents. Mm -hmm. And doesn't have to be binding, thinking... it's just, it's just advisory. So for instance, but you know, what should happen is the government should commission the development of that for their own transparency, but who commissions their own transparency? Well, in Taiwan, the government did, but they were a new government and that was their brand because democracy is new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but of course, transparency means that you have to be held accountable, right? And if a government can get away with not being held accountable, then yeah. So uh, no, I was thinking I think a while back. Mm -hmm. uh, a thought that came to me a while back is uh, why more governments at whatever level don't like financially incentivize voting. Like the opposite is sort of true in countries like Australia, where you, you're financially penalized if you don't vote in the, let's say, general federal election, right? Uh, you're charged, I don't know, like $200 or something like that. Uh, well, the uncharitable but, thing is then more poor people would vote and it would skew uh, out of the interests of the rich. Right. And, you know, I, I'm for that, but right. uh, I, I, I can see why they, why they wouldn't. Happen. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Of those in power, mm -hmm. that would explain it. I, I would submit, and maybe that's too cynical. <laughs> <Even> <laughs> approximation. 
our first, I mean, I mean, leave it this way. There, it, of the explanations to consider, that would be one of them. That's all I'm saying. Right. It, it would be cool if that were the case, perhaps, right? If, if we think about it, you know, if they gave someone that voted some sort of nominal, nominal token amount, like a dollar or whatever, uh, a loony a vote, right? On whatever subject at, at whatever level, like, so there's some sort of bylaw that, that that's getting passed in your city council, and uh, if you show up to vote, then you get a dollar, right? Then more people will, right? It's not something that that would be, you know, a source of real income for anyone, but it would still be an incentive. You know, come to think of it, you should apply this to a question that um, you can see discussed at great length between uh, economist Michael Albert and podcaster Destiny. Um, mm -hmm. when Michael Albert went on Destiny's show. They were talking about how to incentivize participation at decision-making meetings at worker-managed cooperatives because mm -hmm. they were saying like, well, sometimes you have these, I forget where it was, but Michael Albert was telling a tale of a, somewhere, I think it might've been in South America where they did in fact convert a bunch of companies to worker-owned, worker-managed cooperatives. And mm -hmm. perhaps that's good for, um, and perhaps that did turn out to be good for income inequality there, which is Richard Wolf's main argument, uh, or was one of his main arguments that, it's his main argument for how to address income inequality is that worker managed quadrants would allocate wealth differently. Um, uh, but in addition to, but even though it may have achieved that, um, workers would stop showing up at the meetings because they would be like, okay. oh, you know, I don't really care about this, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, um, and Michael Albert's answer to how to fix that is that people's jobs had to be rebalanced so that so the meetings were more relevant to the jobs on average. Because basically, okay. if some people's jobs were more relevant to the decision making meetings, just by the nature of how the work was divided. Um, hmm. So like, you know, like nurse versus doctor was the example they were using and that kind of thing. But your solution sounds a lot more realistic of just financially incentivizing coming to the meetings. Uh, I guess the, the workers could vote against that is the thing. Because mm -hmm. the workers, because if, if they if they really, really don't, it's like if you really, really don't want to go to like worker church or whatever it is, you know, the, <laughs> the church of the proletariat right. or whatever these meetings are, the, the you know, the, uh, whatever they call them that, that makes people not want to go to them. I don't know. I don't know what they call them that makes people go, oh, that's mm -hmm. be, be part of this. Uh, apparently, one of the first things they do is they vote that the meetings are optional. <laughs> okay. Actually, reminds me. Though, they used to call then again, you you like, may run into situations where they they vote to have you know ten times the number of votes to in, in, increase the the personal advantage that they get from them, right? They're like, okay, we can have uh, like a hundred votes per meeting, and we'll get we'll make more money or something. They um, could do something silly like that. Who? Who could the, the, whole, the all the workers? The people that are incentivized to to vote or or to attend meetings, right? They'll just increase the number of meetings to some absurd amount where that is their entire job and they can just oh, be like, I'm, well, I'm yeah, a professional that voter, would, right? That would create bloat, yeah. I mean, I, th I think- um, Vote bloat. I think, I think the Pirate Party is onto something with their concept of a duocracy. I mean, I don't know if it's there. Uh, that's where I know the concept from, is from the Pirate Party, the concept of a duocracy, which is that um, acting first gives you more say. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's a little closer to how reality works. Like, and now the issue is that it's, it's, there's an ableist element to that. And also there's a, a reflective element that you're punishing reflection in some cases. Right. Um, but that being said, you know, maybe- That's a different uh, interpretation of maybe, first that, past that, the that posts, means, right? There's a role in that kind of decision context for those who uh, act fast, to act fast, to say when there should be more time, because you don't want to slow down and reflect on everything, but you might say, oh, here's something mm -hmm. where let's make this part less of a duocracy and this part requires, let's slow it down. Because then you're doing a selective mm -hmm. slowdown rather than doing everything slow. Right, yeah, yeah. with something like that, you'd have to sort of apply some sort of principles to, uh, you know, pick which decisions need to be made quickly and which ones uh, need to not be made hastily, right? Yeah. So uh, like, like uh, Daniel Kahneman's book uh, would probably be, right. Uh, insightful about something like that, mm. thinking yeah. fast and slow, right? Yeah, but it's it, but it's also on the meta level. It's like thinking fast and slow about whether to think fast or slow, <laughs> right? right? There's this other guy's book called uh, In Praise of Slow, a while back. Oh yeah, I've that, heard of it. uh huh. And so, uh huh. 
Uh, like, should you think fast or slow? Think fast. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are advantages to slowing down and reflecting on things. Absolutely. And and that is the, the duocracy thing. It does still fit in the current capitalist mindset of like, let's extract resources faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And that's also like the accelerationist, even the people, there's even people who hate capitalism who think that that should happen faster and faster. They accel like accelerate the end of capitalism by like, it's like a reduction of absurdum, like we're an extra fast. So we see mm -hmm. sooner that change is needed kind of thing. Um, I was just listening but, to but, just before this call, uh, Duncan Trussell, who's a comedian. Uh, have you heard of him? Yeah, I saw him on Rogan. Um, in a space suit. Right. He, he's been on Rogan multiple times and he's just so, so fun to listen to. He is such a psychonaut, right? Uh, and uh, he was talking about the uh, just, you know, very obvious benefit of, of meditation, slowing yourself down, right? And uh, forcing you to not rush through your day or through your life or, or whatever. And uh, it's, you know, it's it's clear that uh, we are overworking ourselves, uh, both as individuals and as societies, right? Yeah, there's no surge capacity. Okay. Just like say more. He was explaining that like COVID doesn't have a bylaw. COVID didn't come from Wuhan. COVID came sure from no surge capacity in hospitals in a sense. Like the, the virus came from Wuhan, but like the the pandemic didn't come mm -hmm. from. Wuhan pandemic came from the economic situation as an economic cause. Mm -hmm. um, there's no surge capacity in hospitals. There's no surge capacity in anyone's lives. That's right, because they're uh, the designed more and more for efficiency rather than resiliency, right? That all the countries have to compete against each other at a certain rate, you know, but like they're, you know, um, in, in many cases, there, there's, I mean, I would say like maybe the rush is in medical research, but that wasn't, that, that's exactly what we're describing this being underfunded, like we're underfunding a hospital, like I'm sure they're underfunding, mm -hmm. research, they're doing that, you know, it's like, it's, they're, they're correlated. Medical right. Generally correlated. Reminds me of, of two very, very different things. One uh, was the new breakthrough in protein folding that just came out. And I was wondering whether perhaps that uh, would be something that could accelerate the discovery of vaccines for situations like this, right? Did you have heard about that? I don't think so. Uh, well, uh, yeah, Google had uh, AI working on on this problem, and when was when it, did the news? What um... uh, a, a couple of days ago, I think. Oh, okay, no, I didn't hear it. Right, so th they've solved protein folding. Oh, like what folding at home was working on. Right, exactly. But they just gave that to an AI and threw a whole lot of horsepower at it and it, it, it you know, figured it out. It can predict protein folding accurately. So that has so, a whole bunch of implications, many of which I don't mm -hmm. understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. Probably many of which they don't understand. True. And so um, the other thing that this reminded me of was uh, I, I just started reading a book about GitHub and how uh, uh, GitHub, the company itself, had made a very wise decision of investing uh, a significant chunk of their time in uh, not just building GitHub, but building tools to build and manage GitHub, right? Mm. Uh, and, and so that's sort of similar to the lack of investment that's going on in, you know, healthcare infrastructure and other types of infrastructure. They're like, okay, we just need uh, enough funding to make sure that our operations continue and that's it. We want maximum efficiency and we don't want to plan for, you know, yeah. yeah. So same sort of uh, thing applies there. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's, it's, the, it's the underlying uh, economic logic, the, the game uh, beneath the game, so to speak. Yeah, the like, it's ex extreme would be like, you just get rid of all R&D, right? What I mean is the software beneath the software, like um, Facebook as a piece of software, you can imagine ways to make it more socially just, yep. but if it's still run by a corporation, the distribution of mm -hmm. money is going to be such and such that it wouldn't be if it were, if, if we were all using software that was designed by say a global worker cooperative. Mm -hmm. Yep. Everything would be well, on a mesh net or something. To improve Facebook. 
2.0. Mm -hmm. All downloads would be via BitTorrent. Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah, intellectual property wouldn't really be a thing in that system. Especially if something as simple as like sharing a log of your own experience would violate intellectual property. If, like, if, like something you would think that the internet in order to wire each other together, there, someone would be able to say, hey, look, here's a video of my whole day from two years ago. But guess what? Some mm -hmm, of that would mm -hmm. be a crime because you're, it's copyrighted music you're hearing when you walk into the bar or something right. like that. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean like the like laws about recording each other, but suppose that you spent your whole day in public. Um, sure. It would still be a crime because you're hearing, because people own your mind and not just in this metaphorical sense, like the actual bits of data stored mm -hmm, in your mm -hmm. are owned by a third party which means you can't actually share your mind with others. There, I'm, I'm just picturing Steve Mann going to a concert. It, it's, it's the anti-kindergarten state where sharing is illegal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Steve Mann went to a concert. Oh No, I, 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 was, I was just imagining how, how that, that would work out, right? So, you know, Steve Mann, the, the, the cyborg, right? Oh, yeah. Just walking around recording everything. Imagine if he were literally just streaming everything to YouTube, there would be a takedown instantly, wouldn't there? Yeah, now, but now imagine that instead of it being, um, like, I, I imagine, that's the publication, but imagine as far as the storage, imagine uh, he just like took drugs that made him have a super memory, right? And so okay. he remembered everything, including all this copyrighted material. And suppose mm -hmm. he took drugs that gave him like a super voice box and okay. you know, people could ask him to sing back exactly what he heard. <laughs> Right. And so, All right. What, 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 I mean, there, there's one way in which it might be a feature rather than a bug, because by demanding that um, copies be different, it might encourage evolution and creativity. That's, that's the only counter argument I can really imagine. Um, okay. Like, for instance, so that would be like sampling music, right? AI that was taking copyrighted YouTube videos and changing them enough so that they mm -hmm. no longer triggered YouTube's content ID, then, sure. um, well, it would be the results would be unheard of. <laughs> right? Well, uh, I, I beg to differ. I think that that's, that's happening right now, right? To some uh, degree, it so is. So then, so that, but it's not very unheard of. But if that process continued, if there was a further, like imagine if, okay, imagine there's a hyper copyright state that aggressively copyrights everything. And so mm -hmm. says that like, as soon as you do that, the, the the copy that was designed to be close to the original is also copyrighted so you can't re replicate that again and that must also be changed and then and then that must also be changed um it, it would accelerate the rate of change right because sure. like right now right now when we have a torrent mm -hmm. and it's a torrent of like the discography of the red hot chili peppers or something and like mm -hmm. what's being sent everywhere is the exact same music but imagine if there was some rule this is why i'm saying it would be unheard of because at first it would probably create noise but uh, if, you, if you had some rule that uh, at each at each time you pass it on, you had to change it like a game of broken telephone. Mm -hmm. Sure. That mm -hmm. could be a way of decentralizing a creative music procedure and creative music algorithm of some kind mm. as opposed to just okay. dis doing distribution. As far as I know, all of mm -hmm. the decentralized music projects right now are all about distribution and all about decentralizing the creative process itself. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to it like copyright, there's also the, the sort of game of cat and mouse, right? There's this arms race going on of the enforcers and the people that are circumventing those rules, right? The same thing goes for uh, ad blockers, for example, right? People right. making better and better ad blockers and then better and better ad blocker blockers and so yeah. on. The cat and mouse, um, cat and mouse um, arms race. Well, when it comes to cat and mouse, does that metaphor really make sense? Because how does the mouse get back? No. Right. Well, the mouse gets better and the cat gets better. Yeah, I guess so. Well, if they're Tom and Jerry or something like that, it makes sense. Yeah, that's, I think that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because Tom and Jerry are the, the prototypical cat and mouse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I, I don't know how much content you want to cover. I don't have any. Um, particular um, time constraints, although in the interest of qu content quality, you, you might want to um, impose some limit. Uh, what, uh, what do you, what do you um, what's on your mind? <laughs> what, what, uh, <laughs> probably loose threads, because basically my, my mind just went blank. So <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Oh, no. Well, th there is tons to talk about. But uh, let's see, it is 315 right now at night. And there there is work to be done tomorrow. But 
you know, I'm not like, there, there, there's no hard constraint. Uh, have you actually been uh, looking at the uh, Verveke lectures? I know that, that he... I, I haven't seen 100% of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Right. There's a part where, you know, hey, it could be me and my resistance of like religious studies in general because of my own personal history converting to mm -hmm. Indian from like sort of Christianity. But um, there's a part of me where my eyes kind of glaze over when it gets a little too deep into like the religio and the everything. And the, right. And, and just like the jargon and because there's a, a honestly mm -hmm. academia alone uh, already produces people who have a hard time communicating with people outside of academia and it's not just because yeah. the content's difficult it is partly because the content's difficult and there's an irreducible difficulty in a lot of things but then there's this additional mm -hmm. difficulty which is classist and it's a shibboleth and you know it has to be removed you know speak as plain and simple and as emotionally as you can actually because it's more mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so um and I, you know, and in that respect, you know, it's I just the, the language because I felt the same way about the language of the church, right? It's not it's not anything unique to Verveke, actually. It's the you know, and I, I felt about academia in general trying to shed academic language. So for that reason, I'm postponing probably uh, deeply listening to the maybe last quarter of the lectures because I feel like mm -hmm. the terminology is so fully entrenched. It's kind of like it's kind of like wanting to delay reading late Plato, which actually makes a lot of sense. Sure consider where Verveke is coming from. It's like, mm -hmm. you know what? I, 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 I feel better spending a lot of time reading early Plato, early Socrates. And uh, mm -hmm. the late Plato, I was kind of like, he sounds a little too established. And like, you know, like, yep. I mean, never, never, you know, not, 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 not that it's, um, there's any parallel criticisms to be made, but, um, but I found, it, I find the voice, the voices with Verveke has been very interesting, although he, uh, not as diverse in terms of subject uh, discipline as, as I, as I would like. I don't think he's talking to the computer science background. Um, and every, it's very focused on the religious studies side of things, but, uh, you know, mm -hmm. he's got a very interdisciplinary background and I think he should leverage that. I don't know, maybe it's, it could just be, um, it could just be self-selecting, like who wants to spend time on YouTube and so on. And, you know, um, sure. Yeah. Right. You know, about two thirds of the way through the meaning crisis lectures. And I, I think the big hang up for me was uh, semiotics, right? But there, there's this bit where they started talking about uh, symbols and, and signifying and, and things of that sort. And that just seemed fairly detached from everyday life. And okay, fine, I, I definitely don't have a background in semiotics, but talking about symbols i can see how it could be useful to some degree well, COVID i don't know my the us right like mm -hmm. like not wearing a mask has become the symbol of being republican or something right um, right there is that that's that's, that's semiotics mm -hmm. i mean if there's a question is like can semiotics be relevant to everyday life i mean i don't know now is the discipline of semiotics going to shed any light on that for me other than just telling me a new way to, to a new set of terms to use to talk yeah. about it I mean, mm -hmm. you have at least one set of terms to talk about it. So if you have no way of talking about it, it's going to get you talking about it. So that's probably good. But then you might find mm -hmm. some way of talking about it if you try to use like the most Saxon English you can find. You know, like if you reduce the number of syllables in English, you end up removing a lot of the Latin and going Saxon. Okay. You'll mm -hmm. see Shakespeare, he goes back and forth, but he'll use the Saxon versions of words and then the Latin versions of words when he wants to have a more like, oh, erudite style. And Right, know, right. But you know the, the the shortest way to speak involves a uh, less Latin language in the context of English, because Latin mm -hmm, is more mm -hmm. syllabic. Mm. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, you? You just sort of brought up uh, being stuck in academic circles, or or no, no, the uh, mm -hmm. no, stuck in a certain language, not 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 in any particular circle. Okay, right. Or having difficulty communicating with people that uh, are not as, as, as uh, I, I don't want to say not as educated, but uh, not as committed to, to academia. Right, there can be two people who have the same number of years of education, but they're in mm -hmm. different disciplines. Um, they're they're going to have, I mean, that was part of the theme of Cognitive, how to address even that problem, right? Um, and you could say that everybody does have an education just in a completely different context. They have an education, whatever yep. their work was or whatever, this, whatever they were doing with their time, they probably mm -hmm. learned something that you don't know. Um, and all of those disciplines, the ones that are, exist on paper and just like the school of life, all of those disciplines uh, need to communicate with interdisciplinarity. Um, 
unfortunately, um, there's no no one discipline's language will suffice for all of the other disciplines to talk in, and and it's not clear that it's going to be um, that all the disciplines have to do the same amount of learning to be able to talk for interdisciplinary to happen. It might be that some disciplines already speak a language which is already more interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. and so that that can appear like an injustice to where like some kind of you know, go in the academic context, you could say like maybe this discipline is like an academic power and it's imposing its language on other disciplines or something like that. Um, it, there might be cases where that's true. Like for instance, you know, like, like debates about whether schooling should be in English or French in the context of Canadian history or something like that, right? Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, if you say, oh, well, there should be coding throughout the curriculum in university, is that the same? Because I think some people read onto that the same kind of historical context and say like oh well, that's just more language imperialism like why should you why or you know why why should every high school teacher have a math test like that was a thing in ontario recently of like which isn't to say that the ford government wasn't doing it disingenuously but nevertheless maybe there should be a math test probably not the one they would design but maybe there should mm -hmm, be a math mm -hmm. test for every high school teacher so that they learn like one theorem a year like i don't know um <laughs> that's better than nothing and like right that's hard like learn a theorem a year just keep just you know, something like that. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. throughout university disciplines, why are all, they're, they're, most disciplines are addressing problems where the people who really want to solve the problems could benefit with, say, some coding knowledge, just like they'd benefit with some like word processing knowledge. Nobody sure. thinks right now that that's imperial, like, oh, you know, how totalitarian to expect everyone to learn to type or something like that. I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder historically when type, typewriters were invented, there probably was that debate then too. Should everyone learn how to type? Should there be keyboarding classes? Should they be mandatory? Can write have just right. as, just as fair an opportunity? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, that 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 was not a, a tie to any particular discipline or group. That was like across the culture all at once. Yeah, that's a big difference. There are probably ways to in, in, encourage that change uh, of of getting people to code by maybe just even calling it something else. Right? Uh, learn how to script learn how to well, actually, you need automate. More, you need more different kinds of, pro like for instance, Max MSP is a visual programming language and like somebody can be mm -hmm. watching it together without knowing that it's programming at all. The UI is great. Right. Typing in the text. Mm -hmm. the yeah, so that, that, that's why a lot, a lot of companies are pushing what they're calling low code, no code platforms, right? So, code, no code. right, so UI path or all of these things that are being called robotic process automation, hmm. right? So you, you just basically drag and drop a bunch of things into a workflow and then it, you know, links up your spreadsheets to your email or whatever, right? Uh, th there are websites like Zapier and if this, then that, IFTTT. Oh, I know that one. Right. I see what you and mean. so. That's an example. Yeah, it's true. That's another example of a UI. Because basically it had occurred to me years ago uh, after I've been doing some UI design for a music AI company. Uh, hi, Glenn, if you're watching. Uh, the uh, um, I, I feel like what we should be working towards is a world where no UI is Turing incomplete, where every user interface okay. is at least Turing complete. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's not as complete as C in the sense that you can really write low-level code. Um, maybe mm -hmm. for security reasons, in some situations, you can't have that. But there's no reason for a UI to not be Turing complete, other than it, it might take work to make it that way. Because it, it's just like because if you come from a principle of maximizing freedom in society period then i think you have to be committed to this because otherwise people will have less freedom to do stuff whatever it is that they're doing sure some other project that enhances some other kind of freedom uh you know mm -hmm. it, uh, it's just giving people the tools and you know there's an it could be an educational barrier in some cases but like for instance max msp is not that hard to learn and it is touring complete um facebook is not facebook does not give you as much freedom as max msp sure. does. and you can basically know so, that in an objective way um, so like if we can, so this means you can actually start to regulate and say like, well, may, maybe the government could say to Facebook, you know, because you're not touring complete, you're objectively not giving people as much freedom as you could over mm -hmm. what's going on in the system. So cognitive prostheses for the masses. I mean, it could be in a democratic way, like people voting can be a way of programming in principle. Like, like there's a, there's a finite number of design decisions to create a program, right? right? I suppose you decompose them into binary decisions. And so the mm -hmm. first bit is the first design decision. And now, of course, there might be some of those might be difficult meta decisions about which order to do the design. But in principle, if there is a series of design decisions, a collective could vote on every design decision. The issue is just okay. how you make that efficient. 
sometimes it's inefficient mm -hmm. and you have to do something else like appoint a benevolent dictator of python or whatever but like in print in, in print right. it's in principle possible to design every last bit of a piece of software with input from everybody now design by committee is, is super time consuming right I, I said that design by committee is, is you know the, this thing that everyone is warned of right you don't want yeah, you know the, a large mass of people yeah it's how the uh, camel was made a committee tried to make a horse or that right yeah. yeah bickering and all that indecision delays yeah, although it, once it's in the, I feel like the software development is the place to experiment with this because then you can start to do the meta analysis more easily of like, well, how quickly do people converge to a decision if the parameters of the meeting are such and such? And like, because mm -hmm. you, you can measure where the bottlenecks are then they actually profile the code, you know? And, okay. and, I, mean, and I imagine they're doing that in Taiwan right now. I mean, um, Aud Audrey Tang, digital minister of Taiwan, um, all of her meetings are live streamed or at least recorded and uploaded afterwards. So there's complete transparency mm -hmm. over that government office. Uh, I wonder if they have policy on GitHub or something. Basically, well, actually what they have is um, all the Taiwan.gov websites. If you go mm -hmm. and change the O to a zero, it becomes this shadow government website where the people can give their own opinion about everything. And there's sort of- What? Yeah, That's kind of cool. It was commissioned by the government. It's through this uh, tool, poll.is, polis. I mean, it was, um, mm -hmm. like, I think they're used for other applications now as well. But um, as far as I know, not by any other governments. Although uh, I don't, what I don't understand is why, well, I, I do understand, but it's like, the moral is I don't understand unless you're evil, why, <laughs> <laughs> why governments wouldn't just copy literally the software and be like, dear Taiwan, because you got to start democracy kind of fresh, you're actually doing it right. Can we have your software? K, okay, thanks, bye. All right, right. But, you know, what they'll probably, I don't know, they, they might try to break up Facebook. They can't, and that's the old logic with Microsoft breaking up the monopoly. You can't really do that with a social network company. It doesn't really make sense. Like, like what are you going to do? Like, build a wall between the users and be like, these people can't message each other? <laughs> like, that's the Facebook wall of Berlin or something. But, um, because they tried to they tried to split Microsoft up. That's the that was the mm -hmm. only way to address monopolies is to split up the company right. into small companies. But I don't, it doesn't make sense. I think you have to commission a competitor. Um, Considering right. companies can buy other companies, I don't see how that's going to be very effective. Considering how company, how do you mean companies can buy other companies and oh, own other companies? Well, yeah, but if it's um like I don't think I don't think you can I don't think companies in Taiwan can buy these these systems. Okay. Yeah, that's I mean, fair. I, yeah, I mean, yeah, there has to be a legislative difference there. Mm -hmm. Have you heard how uh, Trump got his feelings hurt and wanted I, to I, I repeal it in the Section Two Hundred and Thirty? So basically, it's it's we have to deprivatize social media. Mm -hmm. uh, so are right. we, yeah, uh, I was saying that that Trump got his feelings hurt online and uh, basically threatened to repeal Section Two Hundred and Thirty, which is. Uh, it is. It, it has to do with uh, liability of online platforms for the content that users post, right? Oh, and oh, section two thirty. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that's the one the meeting was about the other day before the election. The whole right. The whole yeah. They dragged in all the CEOs. Mm -hmm. So I, I imagine if that happened, right? Of course, it is not likely at all. Uh, but if all of a sudden these giant companies have to verify the content that is on their websites and take down anything that's false. Yeah. That would be, well, for one, not really possible. They'd ha have to dump everything and, sele and selectively curate things that go on their websites. And that just destroys so many business models like overnight. Yeah, that's not the kind of deprivatization that we need. Or that, is mm -hmm. that even privatization? I mean, it's a change in government regulation, but um, right. it's not the kind of change that we need in government regulation. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think. Um, in Taiwan, what I've heard from Audrey Tang's talks is that they have um, they have a government general policy of fighting misinformation with more information rather okay. than taking anything down. So if there are if there are like rumors about the government that are false, they try to just uh, out, outspread the rumor. Uh, rather than um, it's, uh, taking the information down. They don't control the internet to stop the spread of a rumor. Mm -hmm. 
that that would sort of be like the Streisand effect, right? To you know I begin mean, denying. Well, it's, it, the only way it isn't the Streisand effect is if it become becomes very authoritarian. Mm -hmm. Maybe call that the Streisand <laughs> dilemma. You either get the Streisand <laughs> effect, or you have to go authoritarian for it to actually work. Because the Streisand right. effect is so strong, it requires intense intervention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Therefore, instead, just spread the truth. Right. So it, it, if you compare the Streisand effect to, uh, you know, antibiotics and, and you don't take your, your full course of antibiotics, then it, the virus comes back with a vengeance, that sort of thing. Well, not virus, but bacteria. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, because like, mm. like a, if millions of websites were taken down because they had, you know, pictures of Barbara Streisand's house, um, <laughs> then like people, some people would want to know what wait, why, why were these websites taken down and who's Barbara Streisand and wait, where is her house again? And like, you know, it's, it's, right. you know, sick curiosity, arguably, like why, why do, why did people care about, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you can, you can judge those people for sure. Um, but the effect is undeniable, I think. Mm. Cool, cool. Yeah, I think I'm like mentally fading at this point. Yeah, well, let's let's quit while we're ahead. And um, yep, makes sense. Uh, I was thinking to myself in general. Um, first of all, I see a lot of podcasting about podcasting, so I thought, okay, I'll try to not just like launch into meta concepts at the beginning of, of things. But I, I mm -hmm. I've been trying to think about. So you may I don't know if you've seen the show called The Stoa. Verveki was actually on there. Um, uh, Ariel no, I was on uh, earlier. She was telling me about how the Stoa is trying to think of itself as a decentralized podcast. And okay. that actually got me thinking more about, about decentralization in the podcast space in general. And you know, the, one of the ways that the Stoa is decentralized is having more audience participation. Like basically you can attend a lecture. Like I attended one of their sessions and asked Susan Blackmore a question. I was like, oh, this is a neat format that people could even do this. And they actually had Chomsky on a few weeks ago. And it was- mm, it, Cool. Yeah. They have, have interesting guests and um, they have like a variety of different kinds of events. and. I just, it just made me realize that like there are a lot of ways that people could start thinking outside of the box about sort of decentralizing podcasting and, and you know, decentralizing power via um, what we can do while we're all in second lockdown. Because like, also because, you know, you know, music is not amazing on live streams, but like speech works not too bad. And at any rate, the basic concept I was thinking, I, well, I guess I already mentioned it, um, but the, I guess I just wanted to emphasize this idea of that, like, um, if, if, um, like if if um if if you start a podcast, it can be a lot of work, right? Sure. Like not everybody wants to do it because it's like, oh, geez, it's a lot of work. But everybody mm -hmm. wants to talk to people. In fact, it's not. <laughs> sometimes it's the opposite of work. Sometimes people are getting getting spoons. You know, you know, spoon theory. People don't. Have nope. Spoon. Oh, spoon theory is the idea of like to, to avoid like ableist like details. Like essentially, you can just you can imagine that everybody's got a certain number of spoons. Okay. Um, handle and it could be anything that someone's dealing with like an emotional issue or trauma mm -hmm. or pain or anything and um that if somebody somebody if somebody doesn't have the spoons for something it means they're low on whatever their resources are but that they don't okay. get recognized about exactly what what's a spoon for them um that every, mm. everybody 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 measures their spoons differently because everybody's facing different challenges but we all okay. still have a number of them and so like you can't really know how to met you i can't really know how you should measure your spoons but mm -hmm. I can trust that you know when you're low on spoons and you can't handle something versus, oh, okay. have, versus you knowing that you're like, oh no, I have the spoons for this. I, I got the spoons for this. Yeah, I can like listen to what, like what this person, you know, what, what your problem is with this person or whatever it is. Or, and then someone can be like, no, I don't have the spoons. Sorry, I don't have the spoons to, you know, <laughs> I don't have the spoons. That's to interesting. Yeah. I have heard about that before. Okay. Yeah, check it out. It's called Eat. Spoon Theory. But now I forget why hmm. I meant, why did it come up? What was I saying? Oh. So decentralized so, podcasting yeah because not everyone has the spoons to start a podcast mm -hmm. but um but but talking to everyone wants to talk to people in, to an extent and talking to people can be part of how you get spoons and so why is it that so in podcasting it becomes this thing that like people are like oh god i have to like have a a brand and try to promote my thing and blah blah, blah. like mm -hmm, or you can mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. uh, just don't give a shit and just talk to somebody and just change one variable the fact that you weren't recording it and, and putting it online mm -hmm. Do you remember the olden days of the internet when there yeah. were things That's, called web yes, rings? <laughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> people that had their own personal web pages on, I don't know, 
GeoCities or whatever, and and they would have web rings where yeah. you have a, a, you know a certain set of uh, other websites that your friends or associates had, and you just sort of link to them, and uh, they didn't rely on you know massive search engines or anything like that for discovery. That sort of you know mutual promotion. Uh, that's that's sort of so the decentralization in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, the ring topology wasn't good for networks either. Like in right. <laughs> so for uh, sure, that's kind of what's comedic about them almost. Is like, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's nothing nothing essential to the topology about it. Right. Yeah, yeah it cool. could j just as easily be a mesh, but uh, the idea is that not relying on a central well, source to web, web makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> right? True. So web ring it's a web web <laughs> yeah well so oh yeah go ahead so you know, also that, that that's sort of kind of like just having uh, a bunch of people that that are well known in in some sort of uh in uh, a, a collective right uh where if you if you think about you know authors uh, at the time of Mary Shelley, for example, just hanging out poets and writers. Uh, they, you know, there's no sort of real centralization there. It's not like there is this gang leader back in the 1800s of, of, of this collective of, of writers and poets, uh, the, the hippie scene or any of the other uh, cases where, or, or, or like the Frankfurt School. It wasn't really a school, was it? Well. Have you seen many of the Adam Curtis films? I've seen uh, hypernormalization. Okay, I recommend all of the other ones pretty much. Pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, okay. One, I forget which one it is, but they talk about the the huge number of hippie communes that there were at the sort of the height of hippie communes, and mm -hmm. how a, lo a large number of them failed. And their claim, I mean, I suppose you could disagree with it, but their claim is that. Um, they believed in a myth that there wasn't weren't power differences and that caused them to not acknowledge the power differences that were there which ultimately undid the communities um and i think that's okay. kind of right. you have to is it because to me that's not like you have to you have to be anarchist more aggressively than that you have to assume the power is there and go looking for them to find them you have to assume somebody is abusing their power and go find it um, mm -hmm. uh, rather than be like oh no we're all equal we're all great it's gonna be great we're right so that, that well, we ain't equal yet. that's kind of naive here. isn't it but yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, we're not going to get there. You, you can't correct something you won't acknowledge. So you have you have to go finding where there are inequalities. Not yeah. Mm -hmm. They need to invent an inequality problem. detector. I, can imagine, I think it's obvious in, in, if you if you consider the notion of affirmative action broadly enough, it's obvious you have to accept some kind of it. It's like you have to mm -hmm. do something to correct injustices. Surely they exist. So what do you? You mm -hmm. have to take action to affirm things. Um, and you know, here's an, an, another general question for you. Uh, how do you sort of decide what causes to devote your time to? Because if you think about you know anything from uh, anarchy to uh, concentration of power, inequality either of income or power or anything else, then like. There are so many instances of, of where those injustices take place and potentially many cases where you can intervene uh, to some degree of success, uh, but you only have a, a fixed finite amount of time. Uh, like it, it boggles the mind. It, it, it's, it, it poses the potential for like overload of, of options, right? You, you, you're, it's paralysis by, by too many options where Okay, do I care about climate change today, or do I instead care about uh, yeah, poverty, or do do I care about uh, uh, war? What do I care about today? Right. So how how different answer mm -hmm. for everybody, which is mm -hmm. why, like that's in the decentralized spirit, everybody would have a different top priority because mm -hmm. you know, everyone's got a different set of tools. What's your answer? Personally, sure. Well, in the moment, this because I plan to do it, so I stick to my schedule. <laughs> um, okay. And and the personal method that I use is just um, I make I, I I lie around and I worry, which doesn't sound productive, does it? But 
I write down what I'm worrying about. I just write a little worry line mm-hmm. and I just like make a oh. list of worries. I list all of my worries mm-hmm. and then I press enter. And I put most of them off screen and I, okay. leave and I start worrying about that one. And okay. then all right. I indent for things I can actually do about it. And then things I can do mm-hmm. with that, I indent between that, but you have to pick one. And, and if, and if um, you start to get worried, just to go back to the first step again and start worrying more Mm -hmm. and start writing down your new worries if there's new ones or if they're already on the list well then you can pick a different one to work on do you have any tips for prioritizing worries um pick something that seems interesting in the moment okay prioritize personal connections over money fair Hmm. okay i can work with that I don't know if that's right, but uh, I don't know. It, but like I said, everybody should try something different as well. It's a good starting point, at least. Yeah, I mean, I think anything that can increase democracy is a good priority. Um, decentralizing mm-hmm. decentralizing is, is very useful. So um, that's that's part of why I'm trying this. Um, and also trying to increase uh, communication bandwidth. Uh, how like how is... Well. And it, br- it brings people together and communicates more in a given unit of time than you might otherwise. Mm-hmm. How is uh, uh, preference aggregation going? Oh, it's interesting that you asked. I mean, um, when I was reading a lot about that stuff last summer, um, sorry, a year ago this summer, um, I, I started reading more about deliberative democracy, which is strictly speaking outside of the realms of preference aggregation, because preference aggregation is just basically what you do with a ranked ballot and all the different mm-hmm. ways, mixing them together. Um, right. Mathematically, you know, and there's a lot of politics to it, and there should be some kind of meta voting, and that's a difficult thing to figure out in software design. But I think that's that's the future. Um, but there's also the question of like what this part where people talk to each other, uh, the deliberative part. And um, the way I think of it now is I think that votes, the way they're used now, are to shut people up. That we say, well, okay. up, we had a vote, we already voted. Next topic. Mm-hmm. Instead of we could vote at the beginning to see who should talk to who, because if we got a range of votes on an issue, we could say, well, these people, because you could have a spectrum of opinion. And sure, say, okay, who should we pair up to talk to who if we want to maybe not reach a complete consensus, but sort of like make some progress on the issue. Um, you could have different metrics of what is progress because you don't want everyone to agree about everything, but nevertheless. You, you want people to talk so that some agreement is reached for a lot of things, but you want to still be able to compromise with a vote in the end. Um, is, is the idea to pair people to maximize or minimize the difference in opinion? Exactly, exactly the question. So I think maximize the difference is not good because then the, if people are too, because necessarily how would you try to programmatically decrease rather than increase polarization? Right now, Facebook, Twitter, they're, et cetera, they are increasing polarization that seems to be the consensus anywhere you look, even the people who work mm-hmm. with them. It's like, okay, so software is increasing polarization. How could you mathematically reduce polarization? Mm-hmm. Well, getting the people who are most likely to not agree to spend time talking to each other is just going to make them frustrated. Right. So I, I, but people who are in the exact same space, well, they'll just self-congratulate each other and n- neither will change their opinion of anything. So the overall structure won't change. So you have to widen that distance. Basically, I mm-hmm. think that everybody in their life should talk to talk to you know the people closest to you, and then talk to people you disagree with a little more, and then talk mm-hmm. to people you disagree with a little more, and then talk to people you really fucking disagree with, and talk to people you're like <laughs> what the fuck. And but you have to keep going because otherwise right. you're not going to sort anything out. That's if you want to reduce mm-hmm. polarization, you, like you can write the program without a line, writing a line of code and a text editor. Just think about the program that you're running in your life. You know, what, what mm-hmm. choices do you make systematically? A lot of people systematically, they, they, if they're checking a verbal rule, it's not, they're not consulting their intuition or following their heart or, or you know, right. trusting their gut. They're, they're checking a, a verbal rule. Um, mm-hmm. and change a verbal rule. And you can do it in a way which would reduce polarization. That sort of titration of polarization that you mentioned uh, sounds kind of like finding interpersonal flow in, in some sense. Uh, or maybe another uh, analogy could be, the pardon me? Of it. There's, there's a series that Rebel Wisdom put out called like the neuroscience of polarization. And that's basically what mm-hmm. they say. They get more into the physiological side of it like that. 
Okay, cool. And I'm, I'm guessing that some people probably uh, use the metaphor of uh, romantic partners uh, when it comes to pairing up people and uh, deciding what that sort of distance between two people's opinion is uh, is is optimal for for progress, right? Because if you're too similar to a person or you're too dissimilar to a person in both cases, chances are you're you're going to be turned off. Well, you definitely have to have a motivation beyond sex in order to speak to people uh, or romance or love. Um, Just an analogy. I disagree with you enough. No, I understand. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm saying that in order to speak to positive motivations like wanting friends or wanting mm -hmm. sexual partners or wanting romance or wanting popularity, you have to want to argue with people more than that if we're going to reduce the polarization that we have collectively. Sure. These people are not on the same page and we need to be for actually kind of imminent threats like climate change. We, 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 mm -hmm. we don't have a couple hundred years to like be like, okay, we disagreed for a while. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's not just any old historical situation, right? So like that should, mm -hmm. that, should, mm -hmm. that should, understanding that should change how you interact with everyone you know, is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Things that are, that are happening these days uh, in many cases are really unprecedented, right? And that, that poses a really uh, important challenge that our, our traditional models just don't have a clear answer for, right? It's not as though we can point to something in our past and say, oh, as long as we do things that way, the, the way we used to, the way uh, it, it solved, uh, you know, our, our grandparents' problems 100 years ago, we'll be okay, right? We don't have that. Uh, and and since that, that's sort of at least one pillar of, found, uh, of uh, empiricism, right? To rely on past observation, uh, that is an interesting challenge to overcome, especially when it comes to trying to convince people of uh, ways forward, right? If, if it's a matter of convincing people of facts, then that is probably the easier step right? Uh, in, if you move one step beyond just, uh, you know, pointing to facts and then towards what should we do about the, these facts, then that's where the real differences of, of opinion are, right? If there are multiple routes towards potential success, then, uh, and, and there's no clear uh, observable response, right? No, no clear answer that, well, this is definitely going to work and this isn't, then, then I think that's where more of the work lies rather than, than you know, convincing people of facts, which is important and more to which is, yeah. Yeah, because, so, because, because it's, it's, it's irrelevant that you asked about preference aggregation group uh, because I, after studying preference aggregation for quite some time sort of on the side, um, realizing that I wanted to look more at deliberative democracy that connects to something like the idea of a decentralized podcast because like mm -hmm. the health of democracy is tied somehow to the conversations that we have because we're supposed to all talk to each other and have our independent information as well and sort out what to do and talk to our representative and it's like someone's supposed to talk to them um, sure owners <laughs> but um and and so like um actually one thing I was saying to Aaron yesterday um is that you know there's this trade-off between um a completely secret ballot where um, you can't coerce someone to vote because you, you're not able to find out how they voted and a completely open ballot where you know for sure the ballots are counted correctly. Um, but okay. someone could threaten you to make you vote differently. And mm -hmm. so there's a, and right now we have one extreme actually. We have the extreme where everyone's ballot is secret. And in fact, you're not allowed. I mean, I guess it's because mm -hmm. you demanded to do it. But in the case of something outside of just the say the presidential election or the elections in Canada um, w when you broaden out to the question of not just voting but deliberation deliberative democracy not just preference aggregation mm -hmm. um, then you can say well some people are choosing to make their viewpoints public it's true it might sure. not actually vote they might secretly vote differently it's true but let's, mm -hmm. let's say there's at least a correlation there so we don't like to assume it or crazy collective so crazy that we can't get sane collectively so <laughs> Let, right. Let's assume that we could get sane collectively, so that there's some correlation between what people say and what they believe. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know what we do, but well, if there's a strong mm -hmm. correlation, the other way we just assume the opposite. But anyway. 
assume there's some correlation between what people say and what they believe. Okay, and you know, um, well, they're saying all this stuff, and um, the um, they, that deliberation is going to be public or private, and to the extent that it can be made public, some people the thing that some people are willing to speak publicly that provides transparency because then you can check against what you think people are saying privately. Right. Okay. Right. The analogy is with having some ballots being public in an election, but they're they're the co the coercive force because they'll be very strong if people are allowed to. Because um, some I saw a story where a woman had a picture of her ballot, and that mm -hmm. was a crime. Basically, you're not supposed to because if you, if you could take a picture of your ballot, someone could pay you to prove to them that you voted the way you're supposed to according to the money they're giving you. Suppose our elected representatives had to vote publicly. Yeah. Well, well, they do like those records of everything. Oh, for oh, you mean in the election? That's well, mm -hmm. I don't know if it needs to be targeted them. I mean, it's, it's more the rest of their votes that need to be more publicized than they are. They're already voting publicly, mm -hmm. but nobody gets an amber alert about how they're represented mm -hmm. on their behalf. Well, in, in a sense, they're they're almost like professional citizens, right? So they may need to be held to a higher standard. In um, in in Taiwan, they live stream the counting of the ballots. Okay, uh, but but there's no tying to the identity of the voter. Um, sure, but you could also imagine mm -hmm. that some people could opt in and say, like, I will brave the threat of coercion. I will say publicly how I vote. Obviously, in some mm -hmm. cases, it's not going to be such a stunt. It's like, okay, well, nobody cares that you voted for the popular candidate that everyone else is voting for. So, like, but it's still some data about, like, you know, it's more data that you could use to check the integrity of elections. So. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You, you could have an it's like it's like opting into organ donation or something like that right i think the the idea of decentralized podcast is is interesting because it, in the the context we're talking about right now because it is sort of uh uh grassroots uh maybe not deliberate but a grassroots attempt to uh either introduce particular ideas to the discourse like the actual discourse globally, right? Uh, it, e even though it's it's not deliberate or it's not direct, right? So if I'm talking to you about something, for example, then you know you've basically communicated something thousands of miles away that is now in my brain, right? That may, may or may not have, have, have been there before, and then even unconsciously, if I if I begin spreading you know, even one tenth of those ideas around in in my other circles, then that is, uh, it, it's going to have an impact, right? Uh, and so, of course, through repetition uh, and, and through the popularization of this sort of a medium, uh, that'll just be amplified. I mean, what, what I'm hoping is that we can very quickly find people who really disagree. Like you and I don't have any deep, deep disagreements. Uh, but, uh, well, not, not, not so many. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we can use them. But I, I feel like um, in a decentralized podcast, people would eventually travel a certain social network distance and then find, aha, these two people are the closest people in my social network who disagree about this hot button issue. Maybe they mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. podcast with each other. Right. So do and you like, think that the fact that they're close the, in social network distance means they'll they will listen to each other, maybe, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. It's like having a, a mutual connection on LinkedIn or something, but in terms of opinion. I don't know. That, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've never got much use out of LinkedIn, but Yeah, neither do I. Like I, I, I have it and I don't use it. I I just look at it once in a while. I mean, according to Restream, this is broadcasting to LinkedIn, but I don't think it's working. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, just three, three. You have to like one, accounts happen. One thing that that I, I've sort of found interesting about the internet in general is that it really messes with your sense of containment, right? Containment? Like before before the internet, you had a computer and you had data that was oh. in the computer, literally, right? But and nowadays, people do colloquially say things like, well, 
uh, I have the internet on my computer. And, and you, you tend to sort of smile and, and, and you know, giggle privately. Uh, but but it, it, it does still sort of happen, right? Our, our old uh, metaphors just tend, tend to fail, right? Bitcoin blockchain on their computer. <laughs> maybe. Um, maybe. That, that would be frightening, I think. I, I, I still remember when I first realized that I, I could have as many folders as I wanted to on my computer. Freedom. Well, not on yeah. Facebook. You can't have as many folders as you want on Facebook, you see? True. We can't even vote for that. We can't even, I don't know where you want the folders. <laughs> like, but you know, any, any, even the most trivial things, there is no democratic way. You can't even talk to Facebook, let alone have a democratic way to change this. True. Like, mm -hmm. at, at least they act like your representatives in government are going to respond to you. <laughs> In general, mm, right? It, the, it's not set up. Here's the thing: because it's so centralized, it, the government can't engage conversationally with the electorate because it's so centralized, right? It just doesn't work. But like a, a, a BitTorrent stream works in that way, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember one time, I think like 15 years ago or something like that, when I was feeling especially citizeny, and, and I thought, you know, maybe I should actively participate in the municipal decision-making process or something like that. And I also naively just, you know, went to a chapters or something and, and, and tried to look, look for, you know, some sort of a book about how to participate in government. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> there was nothing. There was no like, that can't, be, that can't be good. Local government, yeah, it's, that's rich, yeah. <laughs> well, like in, in, there, there's um, Richard Wolf's book about how to do worker co-ops, democracy at work. Okay, well, that's, that's something. Important a book like there is a there is a this is not quite the same but um there's a the government of canada does have an information guide on worker cooperatives and consumer mm -hmm. on cooperatives in general um that kind of thing but that's more so like a, that's does more mountain a, equipment co-op count until recently they were a consumer co-op um they're not a worker uh they're not a worker managed co-op but okay which i guess is part of the problem because the management changed it from not being a consumer co from being consumer co-op to not being if, if, I, if I'm getting that right, I haven't looked into it, uh, the details of that. But. So th they're, they're by name only? Uh, well, they're, they're already just called, yeah, by name only now, I believe. The, member, th this, it, the memberships are not going to be really worth anything anymore. That's kind of sneaky. Yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but as far as books, yeah, there, there's... Um, well, the founder of the Pirate Party has a book called Swarmwise, which is um, basically outlines how he was able to start the Pirate Party. So that's uh, interesting as far as books and podcasts from Audrey Tang, um, like on this uh, show, Steal the Show, outline a lot of how the Sunflower Movement was able to, um, well, downstream from when the Sunflower Movement um, was able to, um, I think they occupied Parliament in Taiwan, something like that. Um, yeah, how, how, how they did things there. It's almost kind of like a guidebook, except it's not a book, but it, um, but yeah, I can't think of any books about participating and how to participate in municipal politics. I mean, because mm -hmm. here's the thing, the publishing model is centralized. So you'd need a different book right. for every municipality, essentially. It'd be like how to deal with the Ford family or something, you know, it'd be like, if it was about <laughs> Toronto politics, it would have to, right. I mean, I guess um, there was that book about Ford, I forget the, Robin, someone wrote that book. Anyway, um, yeah, so I think that's what it is. Because the publishers want a centralized book that's relevant to everyone everywhere, and mm -hmm. municipal politics, it would be most. I mean, there's probably. I'm sure there is some book. It's just not sold at chapters, um, not mm -hmm. not stock at chapters. Um, but yeah, there are um, some. Uh, um, there are some videos about. Um, well, there are there's some videos about a system called Democracy Earth also that you can watch about people uh, doing sort of more participatory government and whatnot. But the, mm -hmm. all, I, the, all I find is that you can just, you can watch, you know, city hall meetings online and that kind of thing. Um, which by the way, when I was a kid, I was not allowed to watch city hall. I think my mother knew I would get involved in politics. <laughs> you know, it kind of reminds me of the, um, you know, the beginning of, have you ever seen the movie A Man for All Seasons? No, I haven't. Oh, it's really good. I was just mentioning it to Aaron yesterday. Rosina just watched it. Um, I saw it many years ago in like high school English class, but um, it's about Sir Thomas More and how he wouldn't go along with Henry's um, 
uh, change away from the church like a second time type thing. Okay. And um, at, at the beginning, he, he advises this young guy to become a teacher, not become a politician because he'll get corrupted. Um, mm -hmm. but, he, but he does become a politician and he gets corrupted. <laughs> So uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe my mother thought anybody who goes, you, it's, it's, you know, you, 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 you've heard the claim probably that anyone who goes into politics is eventually corrupted by the time they have any power. <laughs> well, it is a very real danger, right? Yeah, and and so like presumably people should want power in proportion to the probability that they'll misuse it. Mm -hmm. um, but it looks like it doesn't quite work that way. It looks like power is. I, I feel like as people get educated, they're also separated for a reason um, in mm -hmm. separate fields, um, uh, which, ha which have very like, in fact, in the Adam Curtis films, they'll talk, uh, you'll see them talk there about um, the, uh, in the USSR, it was a very explicit goal to make sure that engineers didn't have much political consciousness because, because the engineers held the power of the engineering technology. And so if the mm. engineers unionized, they could say, well, we control you now. And so they wanted to make right. sure that years didn't really study you know political history or philosophy or whatever that it's it's the same today is it not like the engineering is a professional program after you know, 2016 there there was a push in the united states to uh, encourage uh scientists to uh or academics to sort of participate in, in the political process more to run for local office things like that and it does make sense but you can see how that's sort of not been uh, even implicitly programmed in, in that no, no, no. sort of segment. Just like, no, stay away. It's not good for you, that kind of only thing. Bad, making money bad, only knowledge. Good. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, that's one of the reasons that Peterson's unpopular among other academics, not just his views, but <laughs> it's an additional reason. Mm -hmm. Because he, he uh, has made money? He made into a business. I mean, that's mm -hmm. his claim. I've heard him make this claim that Oh, those academics are uh, are uh, I'm mad at me because I make money doing the, the way that they could make money, but they're not doing it because they're too pure or something like that. It, it's it, it is on the other hand not fair to sort of immediately label someone as a quack because they do make money, and th that is something that happens a lot. I, I feel. Yeah, I don't. It's it, it certainly. I don't think that's what happened with Peterson. Of course, it's very sure. In some ways, a very simple story. In other ways, a very complicated story. But yeah. <laughs> well um i feel like we've created a quality product here maybe we should uh, i think so i'm going to pause the stream and we can uh decompress a little <laughs> yep uh, for sure let me stop this recording as well folks thanks for okay. uh, i'll be